Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this very special Legal 500 webinar on regulatory aspects of transactions involving Cyprus on merger control and investment screening. Today, we're fortunate enough to be joined by one of the preeminent experts in Cyprus in the areas of competition law and the EU law, with many insights into the aforementioned merger control and investment screening. We will explore the local regulatory landscape in Cyprus and how that might have surprising implications for companies uh, in and out of Cyprus and what they have to take into consideration. Now, one of the reasons we are doing this webinar is because of the change in the landscape, because of all the circumstances that have changed today. And much like someone planning a flight in March 2020, uh, they would run into some surprises today in much the same way there are tectonic shifts in the landscape which would fundamentally shift the paradigm for potential investors um, looking into the, the market in general that we feel like we need to take into account. Now we are joined by Anastasius Andoniu. Um, Anastasius advises multinational corporations and governments on transactional competition and regulatory matters he is consistently ranked by the Legal 500 as a leading Cyprus lawyer in competition law and EU law, and has been described as immensely experienced and very acclaimed with his eye, with an eye for detail. Um, Anastasius is a member of the European Competition Lawyers Forum. He also sits on the Council of the European Regional Forum of the International Bar Association. He has served as an expert on a number of panels, including the European European Commission's Forum for Distributed Ledger Technology, has co-authored Competition Law in Cyprus and is the author of a number of chapters and journal articles on competition law and in EU law. Anastasis, we're very pleased to be with you today. Welcome. Kalimera. Kalimera. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, as I understand it, there's so much to talk about today that will be of interest to both in-house counsel looking to looking into compliance and EU law and looking to navigate the tricky waters ahead because of how fundamentally the landscape seems to be shifting um, as a result of the new conflict in Europe, but other uh, factors as well. Um, so there's a lot to talk about. But firstly, as I understand it, there was a presentation that might help us, uh, that might help introduce some of the notions that we're going to be talking about. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah, uh, I've prepared a few slides, um, right. which I can share now uh, and, and, and go through them. If that's OK. Of course. Apologies, I'm, I'm not that versed in, in Zoom. No worries. Right, so we can see your screen, your screen already. Yeah, perfect. All right. Well, th thank you for the for the intro, Chris. That's uh, very kind of you. Um, now, um, what what we're going to talk about is uh, regulatory aspects relating to transactions uh, that either uh, entail an investment into Cyprus or are carried out through Cyprus. Um, now, what, for those who, who are not familiar with the jurisdiction, Cyprus is an EU member state. Uh, it has the, the euro as its currency. Um, the forecast uh, is uh, for GDP in, in this year is uh, 4.2 approximately percent growth uh, year on year. And the key sectors, uh, industry sectors, uh, hospitality, shipping, professional services, construction, manufacturing, and banking. Now, um, when we say transactions involving Cyprus, and, and, and this is the prism through which we should consider regulatory uh, aspects, um, I, I, I tend to think of this in, in these three domains. Um, so we're talking about transactions that are carried out through Cyprus, uh, using corporate vehicles uh, registered in Cyprus. I'll talk about that. Uh, we're talking about transactions 
uh, that concern direct foreign investment into Cyprus. And uh, we're talking about transactions that uh, involve parties that achieve a turnover in Cyprus, and that's a very measure control uh, specific um, uh, type of transactions. Now, uh, when talking about transactions through Cyprus, uh, Cyprus has the privilege uh, of being used by many uh, multinational uh, groups, um, uh, private equity firms and investment funds, amongst others, um, which use Cypriot corporate vehicles as, uh, either to hold investments uh, or to uh, acquire investments uh, outside of Cyprus. Um, or, or for financing, uh, acquisition financing, project financing. And, and, and often these uh, Cypriot vehicles don't have anything to do with the actual location of the investment. Uh, they are merely used because Cyprus has certain features. Um, it is a common law jurisdiction. Uh, its company's law is very uh, predictable and affords legal certainty. Uh, it's actually modeled after the English uh, Companies Act of 1948, uh, which, of course, uh, the UK has reformed uh, on a number of times. Uh, Cyprus does not reform as much as the UK. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, this gives a certain predictability and legal certainty regarding how the corporate framework works. Um, so uh, in these cases, in this transactions using Cypriot corporate vehicles, um, we uh, often uh, face situations where um, uh, some registrations are required. Um, now, if these, these transactions, if they do not involve um, uh, any activity in Cyprus, any turnover generating activity in Cyprus, it's very unlikely they will require any regulatory clearances. Um, obviously, uh, depending on the transaction, if it's secured financing, uh, we may be talking about certain registrations um, against the Cypriot uh, corporate vehicle uh, for, for collateral it may provide, um, or stamp duty and certain other uh, um, uh, pretty standard registrations, not regulatory, authorizations or clearances per se. Um, now, moving on to more um, uh, meaningful uh, types of transactions for our topic today, um, we, we do have an increased um, uh, foreign direct investment into Cyprus. The, 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 the industries that are shown on this slide are actually the ones that have uh, attracted the most uh, FDI in recent years. Um, so we have a very active banking uh, and debt management sector, um, a very active financial services sector. Um, we have uh, foreign investment in local insurance companies, uh, and, and um, we also we, we Cyprus is also known for being a a shipping hub. Um, and last but not least, uh, given the sun and sea, we we do have a a um, hospitality sector that has been attracting uh, foreign investment. Now, in this foreign direct investment, um, we, we need to consider investment screening, which is uh, a notion that has been actually introduced at an EU level uh, with the EU uh, uh, foreign investment screening regulation. Now, Cyprus has not notified any uh, screening measures, so there is no um, uh, umbrella investment screening regime in Cyprus uh, that uh, screens uh, investments from third countries. Um, there are sectoral authorizations that would be, be applicable depending on the type of the investment. Um, these authorizations uh, relate to performing certain businesses in Cyprus, for example, uh, telecoms or banking services, uh, financial services, uh, managing alternative investment funds and usage funds. Um, obviously, in banking, financial services, and fund management, there's uh, passporting uh, aspects involved, which sometimes, uh, passporting into Cyprus, I mean, which sometimes uh, 
uh, need some notifications to competent authorities. Uh, the same goes for insurance services. Uh, aviation also needs authorization. And of course, uh, very uh, uh, tightly regulated activities like legal services and medical services uh, require authorizations. Um, when we say, uh, when we speak about authorizations, uh, for example, some attendees may be familiar with the qualified holdings uh, approvals, uh, for example, uh, in a bank, uh, any, any person that will uh, intends to acquire a qualified holding of ownership or control in a, in a credit institution will have to get approval by the competent authority, the Central Bank of Cyprus, or if the bank is uh, of a systemic nature, uh, at uh, a European, European banking authority level. Um, now, there's also the aspect of real estate, uh, which uh, Cyprus is a small place, so uh, this may reason, uh, resonate with uh, a lot of uh, general counsel and, and business people. Uh, third country companies or uh, EU companies that are owned by third country nationals, beneficially or uh, directly, uh, will require authorization to obtain certain real estate in Cyprus. Uh, in fact, real estate exceeding uh, a certain uh, square meterage uh, would need to tick certain boxes as to what it will uh, be used for. And in those cases, we will need to be talking about uh, production and manufacturing uh, that uh, uh, use new technologies in, in carrying out business using that real estate in Cyprus. Um, now, um, obviously investments into Cyprus raise merger control considerations, but I will discuss those in the uh, next section, which is uh, transactions by parties achieving a turnover in Cyprus. Um, by turnover, we, we mean sales achieved through, uh, by selling goods uh, or, or services in Cyprus. Uh, now, the, the EU rules apply for the allocation, the geographic allocation of turnover. So when uh, turnover is properly allocated to Cyprus, uh, we, we may be talking about uh, merger control uh, a measure control obligation being triggered for filing and clearance. Now, this concerns concentrations, which would be acquisitions, mergers, and full function joint ventures um, that result in a uh, change of control on a lasting basis, uh, very much aligned with the EU merger regulation uh, concept. Um, the interesting part uh, about Cyprus is that other than the turnover-based jurisdictional threshold, there is no other test to meet for a, a filing obligation to be triggered. So uh, even if transactions that do not impact the market uh, in Cyprus or do not have a local nexus uh, in, uh, relating to Cyprus uh, may, uh, may trigger a filing obligation. Um, as we will see here, the thresholds uh, are pretty low. Uh, these are all thresholds and they remain in force today. Um, and let me just explain a bit how they can be met. Um, so the first one concerns the worldwide aggregate turnover of at least two of the undertakings concerned, so the parties in the transaction, um, regarding each one of them separately. So, if we take an example of uh, an acquisition of sole control of a target business, uh, the parties we need to check regarding their turnover uh, are the acquiring party and the target. If the acquiring party and the target respectively taken separately, each achieve 3.5 million or over on a worldwide basis at a group level, uh, the first threshold is, is met. Uh, we, we, we all realize how easy this is uh, to, to satisfy. The next threshold concerns uh, at least two of the parties, two of the undertakings concerned. So in our example, the acquiring party and the target. 
achieving it and eternal there in Cyprus, uh, again, separately. Um, because this relates to the group, the acquiring party in our scenario may achieve turnover through another business in the group and not the acquiring entity itself. And the last threshold, which relates to the Cyprus specific turnover uh, is again, in my view, very easy to trigger in, in the sense that uh, it relates to the parties taken together, achieving at least 3.5 million uh, uh, of turnover in Cyprus. So in our example, the acquiring party and the target taken together would need to achieve uh, in excess of 3.5 million in Cyprus to satisfy the third uh, threshold. Um, so the, these very low thresholds actually make it quite uh, easy to trigger a filing obligation in Cyprus. Um, just a few concepts here to, to ensure we, we, we're all talking about the, the same notions, which of course EU lawyers uh, attending uh, and perhaps non-EU lawyers attending will be familiar with. Um, the, the, uh, the situation is that foreign to foreign mergers are very often caught and they need clearance uh, in Cyprus. Um, the, the statutory gun jumping fine can be up to 10% of the worldwide turnover of the notifying party group, which uh, can be quite a lot depending on the, on the business. Uh, any business would, 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 uh, should be cautious of that level of fine. Of course, in practice, I must clarify that this, uh, the maximum levels of fines have never been imposed. Uh, fines have been imposed though, including on foreign to foreign transactions. Uh, and there's also 8,000 fine uh, up to 8,000 euro uh, for each day the, the infringement persists. Uh, so just to give uh, a couple more examples, um, a, uh, a, a party, a joint venture in Asia, um, which uh, is set up by parties acquiring joint control, um, where all of these parties um, uh, uh, have a turnover in Cyprus, at least two parties have a turnover in Cyprus, and those could actually be the jointly controlling parties. Um, we may be talking about a filing obligation, despite uh, a transaction that has nothing to do in Cyprus. Um, so even one euro of turnover suffices for a party to be considered achieving turnover in Cyprus which is the second threshold. Um, and uh, even 3.5 million by the parties taken together uh, suffices for meeting the third uh, threshold. Um, so we, we can discuss, uh, depending on whether there are any questions as well, on, on whether this is, um, uh, how, how this works in practice. Um, but overall, um, if we're talking about the regulatory aspects uh, in, in, in transactions involving Cyprus, we, we must recall that there, are, there is no uh, umbrella investment screening measure. Um, at least it's, it has not been notified to the European Commission yet. Um, informally, we know that Cypriot authorities are having second thoughts on this and are actually uh, exploring whether such uh, an investment screening regime should be uh, devised and implemented. Um, the, the, the thoughts are quite prevalent. They're obviously affected by the changing landscape, which you mentioned, Chris, uh, at your introduction, uh, but this is work in progress. So we, we would need to look at sectoral authorizations for every transaction, depending on the industry it's happening, and the precise activities it concerns. Um, and last but not least, the measure control considerations should apply, should be assessed, even if the transaction uh, has lo no local nexus to Cyprus. So Cyprus is uh, a very predictable jurisdiction. Um, it is a small jurisdiction, but it also has authorities which are increas increasingly willing to show their teeth 
and uh, caution is always advisable uh, together with a proper risk assessment uh, in each case. Um, I've kept it short. Uh, perhaps uh, we can open the ground for any questions, uh, but Chris, uh, if, if anything was not clear, please let me know. Absolutely. Uh, thank you very much, Anastasis, for that. That was very informative. Um, in fact, um, some of the audience members are asking if they can have access to the slides. Um, they, they probably found it just as informative as I did. Um, I would just like to mention that if there are any questions at any point, um, please feel free to put them forward to us and Anastasis um, and I will consider them. Um, just whilst the audience is considering any possible questions, Anastasis, there was a number of issues that seems to stand out to me before we move on. One is really the, the fact that, and we, we did touch on this um, whilst talking about this previously, but it really is the low threshold for triggering uh, filing obligations, which is, I mean, it was certainly news to me. I, I, I cannot by any means profess to be an expert, but it certainly is something that, um, it's something that is easy to slip under the radar, right? And I'm wondering whether uh, regulators are triggering these the, um, these fines often. Is that something that happens? I, mean, I know you mentioned that uh, it's a relatively rare occurrence, but um, this is certainly something that GCs and lawyers need to be aware of um, when navigating the landscape. Absolutely. Um... Yeah, and, and, and uh, I agree, a proper uh, risk assessment should always uh, look at whether the Cypriot uh, thresholds are met, and I'll explain why I'm saying this. Um, well, obviously, the Cypriot Competition Authority, which is the competent merger control authority, um, is part of the European Competition Network. So despite it being a small authority in a small jurisdiction, it, it does take part in the dissemination of information at the European Competition Network level. So uh, it, it does become aware of filings in other EU member states. Um, for those interested, Cyprus has not to date uh, uh, referred transactions under the new Article 22 guidelines of the European Commission. I'm just noting that for completeness. Um, Another reason that a proper risk assessment should take place um, uh, in terms of whether the Cyprus filing is triggered is that uh, a lot of parties uh, have future filings in Cyprus, which they, they know in advance or they may not be able to avoid uh, filing in Cyprus. Um, so they don't want to inadvertently um, uh, make a filing that reveals a previous transaction that ought to have been filed. Uh, so that, that may be an area of concern. There are many other reasons, but um, it's, all, it's definitely not uh, a, a matter to be, be taken lightly with how easily the, the thresholds are met. And just to address your question on, on, on trends in practice, um, the, the, no, fines are not often, uh, that's true. Also, the Cypriot Authority has never exercised its power to dissolve, to unwind a transaction. Um, so it, it is a reasonable authority, but it, it is also an authority that uh, uh, is very rigor rigorously monitoring the market to the extent it can, and has in the past imposed fines, um, even in, in relation to foreign to foreign mergers. So, so whilst it is by all means a friendly jurisdiction and authority, uh, it is nonetheless something that uh, local council uh, lawyers interested and investors should absolutely be aware of uh, that, you know, this may not have happened thus far, but it's absolutely useful to know that the thresholds are, qu are quite low and they can be triggered quite, quite easily. Um, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, so there's a lot of things to take into account uh, about the local market. Uh, you mentioned some very impressive growth figures. Um, is that something that you expect to continue in the current climate? Well, um, I presume you're, you're, you're also taking into account the, the events over the past two months. Indeed, um, yes. Yeah, I mean, uh, Cyprus's uh, exposure to, to um, uh, Russian capital is well known. 
Uh, so I, my, I mean, I'm not an economist, but my expectation is that there, there will be uh, an impact. Uh, so anything forecasted uh, for this year, last year, uh, would uh, would need to be revisited. Uh, but of course, um, w w the jurisdiction is is rather versatile and uh, always pursuing new new opportunities. Despite uh, you know personal views regarding the the economic model deployed uh, that anyone may have, uh, including myself, um, we, we do tend to uh, survive uh, a geopolitical crisis, uh, whether regional or global, uh, in, a, in, a, in a very decent manner. Yeah, and we, we also have to mention that in your presentation, you did mention all the reasons, all the favorable circumstances, you know, the, the, in the regulatory landscape uh, which seems to provide a certain level of assurance, a, a bottom a baseline for investors uh, to attract capital and for economic activity. So that, that is un very unlikely to change as a result of that. But obviously we have to take into account the wider uh, situation. Um, so be beyond, beyond the, the recent events, are there any big trends, Anastasis, that you would like to highlight if, if in your experience you're seeing them emerging um, and what issues come up most frequently in your experience when you talk to industry professionals and in-house counsel? Yeah, well, okay, uh, from a, um, an economic sector perspective, the, the past few years uh, have seen a lot of activity in the banking and debt management sector. Um, Cyprus made a, a very big effort to um, uh, clear uh, bank uh, balance sheets um, uh, from uh, non-performing loans uh, and quite innovative platforms have set up shop uh, in Cyprus. Um, we, we've been involved from, from the outset. Uh, as a firm, we, we set up the first NPL uh, um, um, uh, management servicing platform uh, on the island, which needed both uh, uh, merger control uh, clearance and some regulatory approvals. Um, and that is a sector that will be regulated under a relevant EU directive uh, that will be transposed uh, at some point for, for the licensing of credit services. Um, we've also seen a lot of investment in construction um, that was primarily driven by a, an investor naturalization scheme, um, which did not uh, afford Cyprus the best of reputations, but uh, it did lead to uh, a construction boom. Um, and we also seen a lot of foreign investment in um, hospitality. So I think that in some parts of the island, due to foreign uh, capital um, channels into certain hotels and resorts, uh, that sector has, has been uh, thriving lately uh, in a very impressive manner. Okay. That's quite interesting. Um, so I think, Anastasis, this all gives us a very satisfying overview of the situation on the ground and what trends you would like to highlight. Now, we could slowly turn the conversation towards merger control, if, if that's OK, since this is one of the main topics that we're talking about today. Um, I was really wondering, and I, I assume a large portion of the audience is too. Oh, and before we move on, apologies. Uh, the audience is asking if we can share the slides, which I assume that would be something that you might be uh, happy with us to do, uh, Anastasis, on your part. Um, since, uh, yeah, your expertise is sought after in these matters, it seems. Um, can you expand on the uh, specific factors that make Cyprus a unique jurisdiction when it comes to merger control specifically? And what sort of things would you flag up to GCs? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um... I, I admit, measure control, the Cypriot measure control regime is uh, rather uh, surprising for, for those who have not uh, come across it before. Um, and and in, in, some, in some terms, uh, it requires uh, you know, elevated attention, uh, purely because at the, at the crux of the discussion is uh, the, the, the turnover, the, the solely turnover based thresholds. So that's not something you meet in other EU member states or in other jurisdictions. There is no fast track um, uh, process or short, short form filings, which um, EU lawyers uh, or even US lawyers may be familiar with. Um, so 
we're talking about situations where acquisitions or mergers that have nothing to do with the local market, if the parties meet the turnover thresholds, nothing else is required for a filing obligation to be triggered. Uh, and this has to be, you know, the full Monty. Yeah, it, um, uh, uh, an A to Z uh, notification that would be the same as if two major dominant players in Cyprus were merging. Um, as, as a lawyer, I obviously uh, don't agree with the, the current status um, uh, because uh, it's not very business friendly, adding um, a, a, a small jurisdiction's uh, clearance uh, uh, requirement for the closing of a transaction. And Cyprus uh, clearance is suspensory on a global level in the sense that if Cyprus clearance is not issued, the transaction as a whole cannot proceed uh, from a Cyprus law perspective always. Um, so I would say that uh, it's about time Cyprus considers whether it wants to stick to turnover only thresholds. Uh, Austria has recently uh, reconsidered its position, which was similar previously. Uh, but for the time being, this is the situation and it needs a lot of consciousness. So um, with regards to steps to remedy this, uh, from your experience, uh, what sort of things have you had to do to deal with situations like these? And in, in terms of trying to remedy the situation, would you emulate what steps, and just for those of us in the audience who are unfamiliar with that, would you mind introducing uh, what uh, is different about the Austrian situation? Yeah, um, I mean, not just the Austrian situation. Obviously, um, first of all, the, the turnover thresholds can be increased. And uh, those can be increased without a statutory amendment because uh, um, the, the, the existing law gives the minister, uh, the competent minister, the power to increase, increase the thresholds. Uh, that's, of course, an indication that Cypriot authorities may not be willing to do that for the time being because it's relatively easy for it to happen and it hasn't happened for a while. Um, but, uh, for example, other, other um, tests could be introduced in addition to turnovers for, relating to market share, for example. Uh, another peculiarity of Cyprus is that uh, for an affected market to arrive in a merger control uh, notification, uh, in a concentration, and when we say affected market, uh, we, we mean the market uh, in which in, in, in layman terms, in, in which uh, issues may arise uh, from a competition perspective. Um, it's 25% uh, uh, um, uh, between the combined market shares of the, of the parties. Uh, this is higher than the EU affected market uh, share threshold. So there's, there's, there's some balancing uh, yeah. in, the, in the mix, uh, in the sense that it's easier to trigger a filing, but it's slightly more difficult for issues to arise. So having said that, um, transactions which raise no competition issues in Cyprus are typically uh, swiftly uh, cleared. Right, I see. I see, thank you, Anastasius. Um, I was wondering if we could next talk a little bit about the role of um, foreign direct investments, uh, particularly over the last couple of months and um, the trends that you, first of all, if you could just give us a little bit of an overview in your experience of how do you see a foreign direct investment over the last couple of months and over the immediate future. Uh, and mm. then what, what would you expect, what advice would you give to a reasonably interested investor over, over this situation? Yeah. Well, uh, the, the situation is not entirely clear, of course, regarding foreign direct investment. Uh, I, I don't think Cyprus is the only jurisdiction suffering from, from um, ambiguity uh, as to what the future holds. Uh, as, as discussed during the presentation, uh, the past few years have seen major uh, foreign direct investment in, in, in local businesses with a, a, a global footprint operating out of Cyprus. Uh, in the banking, insurance, financial services uh, sectors in particular, uh, a lot of real estate uh, investment was uh, attracted. 
um, the, the last couple of months, uh, uh, you know, have, have created kind of a limbo situation in the sense that there's no certainty on uh, what would have been a long-term investment um, as to whether that would still remain uh, and, and continue to be, to be channeled uh, into uh, operations in Cyprus. Uh, having said that, um, uh, Cyprus is not as dependent on, on Russian investment as, uh, you know, uh, uh, many, many may think. Uh, uh, major US and, and Western European players, um, uh, global US private equity firms uh, actually have established themselves in Cyprus. So um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm reservedly optimistic that the situation in Ukraine, which we, we all hope uh, can uh, end as soon as possible, um, will not be so detrimental to Cyprus and, and Europe generally, although that remains to be seen. Of course, yes, and I, I absolutely appreciate that there's a lot of unknowns in this equation right now. And uh, as events are unfolding, um, we are observing events uh, happening before us in real time which makes it all, all harder to navigate these waters. But that was actually going to be my next question, Anastasis, about um, whether you have seen foreign direct streams of FDI um, supplemented by other sources. So uh, from the European Union, uh, America, or other, other players, other actors, have you seen um, streams uh, supplementing what, the, or partly or attempting to, or is there any mobility there um, with foreign direct investment uh, to take to turn this into a little bit of an opportunity to, to maybe open up doors that previously might not have been open? Yeah, I mean, like every EU member state, uh, Cyprus has a, 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 a recovery and resilience plan um, uh, being deployed uh, currently. The the, the Cypriot resilience plan is uh, at approximately 1.2 billion, uh, which is mainly uh, financed through non-repayable financial support uh, uh, by, by, the, by the EU. Uh, that's at 1 billion and, and uh, a loan of uh, 200 million that makes up the total of 1.2. Um, and, and, and that resilience plan actually has very key, um, uh, well, potentially multiplying uh, uh, game changes for the economic model of Cyprus, uh, such as uh, a, a focus on green taxation, uh, on energy efficiency and renewables, on er energy interconnection. Cyprus is an isolated energy market uh, and promoting uh, sustainable and green mobility. Um, th these are very specifically uh, uh, set out in the resilience plan. Um, and, and we can see uh, Cyprus taking a turn, uh, perhaps a long overdue turn to, to, to that direction. Um, so uh, we, 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 we do see EU support in a, in a very tangible manner. Um, and um, the, the European Investment Bank is now announcing uh, additional uh, financial instruments. And, and Cyprus is at the same time, increasingly placing itself as a, as a global financial hub. And this is not just um, you know, a, a theoretical or, or axiom or, or wishful thinking. Uh, we do see uh, uh, very uh, serious global players, uh, private equity firms uh, in particular, using Cyprus for their global transactions um, uh, because of the advantages we discussed uh, earlier. Yes, and not, not only is, there, is Cyprus a jurisdiction which provides a lot of uh, assurance and relative safety to, to people uh, to lo people looking to invest, do you also see perhaps sustainability playing a role uh, in driving these forces forward? Do you, do you see that uh, as possibly providing uh, an opportunity for investors uh, under the current climate? Yes. Uh, well, obviously, this depends on, on authorities uh, uh, doing a good job at uh, 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 considering uh, projects and applying funds in a, in a sensible manner. Uh, but uh, sustainability and all that it encompasses, uh, because that, that sustainability, I don't, I don't think, is exhausted in, in uh, renewable energy uh, or, or uh, green mobility. 
uh, it also encompasses, in my view, uh, the digitalization of uh, and, and the improvement of infrastructure in, in a manner which harnesses technology to the fullest extent possible. Uh, uh, from what we're seeing, the Cypriot authorities have a very solid plan uh, in that respect. That is also independent of local politics, uh, which is always uh, helpful. Absolutely. I can see. Um, I see. Thank you, Anastasia. Um, so a lot of uh, topics were covered in the, in the presentation already. Um, and I was wondering if we could spend a little bit more time to remind our audience the very basics about the you mentioned in many details uh, about the uh, regime of uh, in, uh, investment screening uh, inside. Oh, apologies. We seem to have um, a question from the audience. Uh, someone's asking, could you give an example of what you mean by sustainability and digitalization? Yes, obviously, this is not a, a legal point to say. Uh, what I mean by sustainability in digitalization is the the resulting sustainability uh, for for the for the economy as a whole that can be brought about by uh, the digitalization of uh, uh, the public and private sector. Right. Um, so thank you for that uh, question to the audience. May I just remind the audience that we do welcome. Uh, questions. They are one of the main drivers making these webinars very memorable and uh, we're here to answer questions. We're very fortunate to be joined by Anastasis, whose expertise uh, sheds light on a lot of these issues. So uh, going back to an investment screening regime, um, Anastasis, just now. So we, we highlighted um, one of the things I wanted to talk about before was when you mentioned uh, real estate and the author, uh, relative um, authorization required there. Now, you did mention that there is a lot of activity happening. Obviously, Cyprus is a relatively small country in, in terms of uh, total area. Um, could you speak a little bit about the role of real estate um, um, when it comes to uh, foreign direct investment? Yeah. Um, well, Real estate has, has obviously been a very um, a peculiar, uh, very idiosyncratic sector for, for, for Cyprus in, because of the size of the, of the country. Um, obviously, there's no restrictions regarding EU uh, uh, nationals and EU businesses regarding real estate. There's restrictions, as we mentioned, regarding uh, non-EU nationals, uh, whether directly or through uh, uh, corporate vehicles. Uh, acquiring real estate. Uh, having said that, uh, Cypriot authorities have always been very keen on, on attracting foreign direct investment in, in operations that also uh, uh, utilize uh, real estate, um, uh, whether that's in industrial zones or uh, otherwise. Uh, for example, uh, uh, we, we do have uh, some cloud sensors um, uh, uh, popping up. Um, and or, or, or real estate for other purposes that are being acquired, such as for for, for storage or, or to, and transport, um, and and uh, or for the development of, of large uh, large uh, projects, uh, whether in hospitality or for industrial use. Yeah. Um, you did mention I, construction previously. Sorry to interrupt. You did mention that this was a thriving sector under under yes. circumstances. And I, I take it from what you're saying just now that you expect that trend to continue into the immediate future. Yep. Um, I, I see a question, Chris, regarding um, well, ESG policies. Yes, um, the, many thanks to the audience for um, asking these questions. Do you believe that ESG policies are at odds with corporate finances? I personally don't believe that. Uh, uh, qu quite the contrary, uh, and that also links back, uh, in my in my view, to the sustainability uh, point made earlier. Um, uh, so the the, the the Cyprus Cyprus has uh, a prominent role in in corporate financing transactions, and I I do see and there are initiatives, uh, whether prompted by legislative requirements at an EU level or local uh, initiatives to uh, and uh, 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 instill ESG considerations 
in, in uh, financing transactions. Um, yeah. So yes, I, 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 I don't see them at all, uh, quite, quite, uh, quite the contrary. Quite the contrary. Um, and, and, and perhaps just to, since we're on sustainability still, to, to, to address uh, um, uh, Ms. Piri's uh, first comment on uh, sustainability and digitalization. I mean, obviously Cyprus has, is, is so, was traditionally so much lagging behind in digitalization that um, uh, any, any transformation that can happen uh, uh, through digitalization, uh, in my mind, uh, will inevitably be uh, 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 fast uh, uh, sustainability uh, benefiting, benefiting the environment uh, and local communities. I see, I see. Um, there's a couple more questions on sustainability that I can see, but before we get to that, the gentleman who asked the question about the slides, just want to mention that we did answer and Anastasis would be more than happy to share. Also to mention that this uh, webinar is being recorded, so uh, anyone wishing to go through the slides uh, with a helpful commentary of Anastasis to understand them better, We'll be able to do so on our website. Um, so moving on, thankfully we do have a lot of audience engagement. Um, and I said before we move on, Anastas, I wanted to check with you. So you do you do say that you, you don't you do not believe that there is a fundamental conflict between ESG policies and corporate finances. Um, do you find that the same is true with regulators uh, operating in Cyprus today? I think we're we're at an early stage in terms of uh, ESG and regulators uh, in, in, in Cyprus. Um, uh, I think this is a domain where the uh, private sector is ahead of uh, regulation. Um, although there's clear uh, development uh, in that front at an EU level, um, um, we, we, I think that ESG is primarily also a, a cultural consideration uh, at uh, boards and uh, uh, finance uh, finance teams. Um, so, so whilst you're not seeing any direct opposition to these policies, you do see that the private sector is a little bit ahead and that the expectation is that regulators will follow suit in one way or another. Uh, there isn't anything to indicate resistance to a, a lot of these policies on your, in your experience. No, I, I think um, it's, you know, it's an idea whose time has come and, and it will be implemented uh, in the same manner that, for example, uh, we see at an EU level, uh, um, uh, due diligence on human rights in, in relation to, to companies and, then, and their transactions. So these, these non-corporate, uh, non non-business considerations, uh, which are in, in actual fact business considerations because the impact on the environment, the impact on local communities, uh, and and, and uh, generally, the, the, the what ESG encapsulates, uh, as well as human rights, are increasingly relevant to cross-border transactions, in my view. Right. Uh, well, we we do have a relative um, um, uh, related question on cross-border transactions. Do you believe that transaction policies are at odds with cross-border finances or transactions? I didn't quite get that, to be honest. Um, but uh, I mean, to the best of my understanding of the question, um, the policies Cyprus has in place are always facilitative of cross-border finance transactions. Uh, um, uh, the company's law, as we discussed, is modeled after the English, uh, its English counterpart. Uh, so a lot of tools that facilitate cross-border financing are available, like redeemable equity, uh, is a very popular example uh, in Cyprus companies. Uh, so if I got the question right, and apologies if I didn't, uh, but I, I think they're not uh, at odds, no? Uh, yeah, as, as far as I can understand it, maybe the questionnaire uh, uh, means to say uh, regulators, uh, if, if yeah. there are impeding progress in, term, in, in that regard. It, again, to the best that I can understand it. Uh, another question is, uh, how important do you view in-house counsel to be in helping shape overall finance teams and corporate strategy? So this is an interesting question, which we are touching on uh, at the Legal 500 quite a lot, because we really do believe that in-house counsel can play a very pivotal role in the organizations. And um, we do want to encourage in our conversations with lawyers 
um, the exchange of ideas between prominent lawyers from a private sector, such as yourself, and also in-house counsel, um, we do find that a lot of the time they, they can really benefit from each other's expertise. And, you know, sometimes I'm, I'm sure you've come across this, Anastasis, when you approach a problem for a very specific viewpoint, uh, an obstacle can seem insurmountable. Uh, and suddenly, through a simple exchange of ideas um, with someone from a different vantage point, um, all of a sudden there's more perspective and more solutions. So I think the question in this um, um, instance is, how important do you view in-house counsel for corporate strategy in general? And it would also be interesting to me if you also spoke a little bit about your interactions with in-house counsel and how you view that relationship. With yeah. Um... I mean, for, for outside counsel, the interaction with in-house counsel, uh, in, in my view, and that's how we, we generally practice as, 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 as a firm, uh, should be at the very core of the relationship with the client. Um, uh, counsel, in-house and outside counsel uh, uh, speak the same language. Uh, in-house counsel should definitely be involved uh, from the very early stages of financing transactions and, and, and uh, corporate strategy as a whole. Uh, uh, be, being aware and bringing to the table all the regulatory challenges uh, and all the, the legal and uh, the enforcement trends, uh, and also being the, the voice of the, of the client towards outside counsel. Um, uh, we, 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 we very much focus on this and, and develop uh, relationships with in house counsel uh, uh, to, to, to a very deep extent. Of course, Cyprus, as, as a market, I must say that um, only has in-house counsel in certain industries and for certain company sizes. Um, uh, so what I mentioned earlier uh, is, of course, applicable to a lot of Cyprus companies, but it's primarily applicable to uh, global in-house uh, teams instructing uh, local counsel in Cyprus. Yeah, uh, that, that is something that uh, we don't often come across. So you say that general counsel tend to be found most in specific industries and certain company sizes. Uh, but from your answer, I take it that you would encourage um, companies to look into having that sort of counsel, having that sort of person to reach out to. And also, and please uh, correct me if I'm taking too many liberties with your answer here. I, I think what you're also getting to is that the companies that already have uh, in-house counsel to sort of expand their role somewhat into more responsive, as more regulatory, uh, as, as the regulatory landscape keeps changing um, to keep expanding that role. Is that, would that be an, a fair assessment? Yes, that, that's, that's a very fair comment on, on what I just said. And of course, uh, we, we, I mean, because we view in-house counsel as uh, an integral uh, team player uh, in any transaction, in any project, and in the overall corporate strategy, uh, we very much encourage uh, uh, companies to, 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 to have in-house counsel. In fact, um, uh, recently we, 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 we uh, encouraged uh, some clients uh, too, too strongly, uh, and they ended up uh, hiring in-house counsel on our recommendation, uh, because it makes, uh, it makes the relationship seem more seamless and it facilitates uh, transactions. Another uh, point on this, Chris, is that um, uh, with reference to Greece, um, we have seen a lot of instances over the years where in-house counsel um, um, uh, is used in a group of companies to cover both Greece and Cyprus. Uh, while I appreciate that there's also financial resources informing that decision, uh, we must also keep in mind that Greece is a civil law country uh, with a very specific uh, uh, legal system uh, and procedures and enforcement trends. And Cyprus is a common law country with its own set of, of procedures, uh, uh, enforcement trends, uh, and so forth, and, and authorities. Um, obviously, at an EU level, there's a lot of mirroring of competences and supervisory authorities, but we generally always advise that um, even from an in-house council level, uh, uh, Cyprus uh, law knowledge uh, is there because uh, Greece and Cyprus, uh, despite language and, and, and cultural uh, links and ties, uh, should not be packaged in, in, from a legal perspective. 
yes, that, that makes a lot of sense. Absolutely. Um, we have a uh, different question on a um, which touches on tangentially what we're talking about, which I think we can answer uh, right on time. Uh, and this refers to, do you think we are too late policy wise uh, considering the environmental data? Now, I appreciate this is more of an environmental question, but I think this uh, really touches on, uh, I mean, whether or not one agrees or if, if we are told too late or not from an environmental standpoint, it sounds like uh, the challenges of the last couple of months and over the last couple of years really opening up some opportunities. And do you see that? I'm going to turn the question slightly into, do you see environment opportunities that the current situation in the environment uh, opens up for Cyprus specifically, such a rich island in natural resources, in, in um, sunshine, in renewables? Uh, mm -hmm. Do you see an, an opportunity there in the current landscape in, in the light of everything we've talked about? Yeah, uh, that's a very good point. Um, I mean, we do have some visibility being uh, a, a regulatory team in, in a Cyprus law firm in the sense that we, we often deal with um, uh, uh, environmental uh, matters and lately uh, climate change uh, specific uh, 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 environmental matters. Um, as you mentioned, Cyprus is very rich in, in, in energy resources, um, uh, but it has not harnessed uh, this uh, from a renewables perspective yet to the fullest extent possible. Um, uh, for example, uh, the, the, uh, I, I, I think it has the, the most uh, sunshine uh, in, in, uh, amongst European uh, EU member states. I would not be in, surprised, yeah. <laughs> so, but it's nowhere near what, for example, Spain is doing with um, uh, uh, solar power. Uh, of course, there's, there's a lot of projects uh, there's a lot of movement and there's a very active um, uh, energy regulator uh, that uh, is, is very proactive uh, and, and business friendly to the best we've seen. Right. Um, we do have a last minute question, which I think we can squeeze in right before the end. Uh, it's mentioning uh, tax cheating in Greece, which is, seems to be, according to this questionnaire, quite widespread and uh, comes with a substantial cost to the economy. Um, how are you, the questioner asks, how are you approaching this trend and how does your law firm avoid um, getting into trouble with this situation in Greece? I, I'm not sure I, uh, I, I'm just, um, um, I'm not sure, yes. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not familiar with the precise uh, data or, 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 or trends. Um, of course, we should say that in, in common law countries like Cyprus, tax is mainly dealt by uh, accountants, not lawyers. So I, I'm not a tax lawyer, nor do we have uh, tax expertise as a, as a practice. Uh, but generally, uh, what I can say is that um, uh, between Greece and Cyprus, there's a uh, double tax avoidance treaty, uh, which uh, uh, facilitates uh, a seamless uh, a seamless uh, taxation uh, relating to groups that have presence in both countries. Uh, there's also the parent subsidiary directive of the EU, which uh, pretty much does similar, similar uh, facilitation. Uh, and in terms of uh, tax evasion, if, if so to say, um, uh, obviously Cyprus has a tax efficient uh, uh, regime, and this is in place to attract uh, businesses, so whether this is for developing intellectual property or having innovative uh, businesses uh, set up shop uh, in Cyprus. Uh, what, what we don't do is engage in practices like we've seen in other countries um, uh, where, you know, uh, tax rulings, because they were bespoke, um, resulted in state aid uh, uh, decisions, finding them illegal. So. Cyprus is well known for uniformity on the application of, of, of tax laws. And of course, all, all tax uh, laws are, are, are in alignment with OECD and BEPS uh, principles. But as I said, uh, professional tax advice should be sought by tax advisors, which in common law countries tend not to be lawyers. Absolutely. And thank you for your flexibility in questions, uh, wanting to accommodate th this question as well. Um, and it does speak to uh, the the 
state the regulatory continuity and safety of Cyprus that um, it, it tends to handle these matters uh, in, in such a way. Uh, now, as we're bringing this to a close, I wanted to bring the conversation back into um, what we opened with, mainly uh, merger control and investment screening. And we have, through all these topics that we touched on, uh, we have seen, um, we have got a very good overview from yourself, Anastasis, uh, about how the situation is currently unfolding and what has led up to it. Um, if you could dare to make a few predictions for the immediate future, uh, what would those be, uh, in your opinion? Mm -hmm. um, I, I, yeah, that's a very good question. Yeah, I must say the questions in, in this webinar are really, <laughs> really Brilliant. nailing it. Yeah, Indeed. Uh, yeah. Um, my 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 own prediction uh, from what we've seen, you know, over the past uh, two decades and what is happening right now is that we we are at a unique uh, uh, junction, and um, uh, this this such a tectonic shift uh, in terms of um, uh, uh, what foreign direct investment uh, each country can attract, uh, in what sectors and from which countries. I mean. Uh, that a lot of uh, a lot of aspects are still unknown, uh, but regarding Cyprus in particular, I think that uh, we will see a continuation of recent trends, which is increased regulation, not always on Cyprus' own initiative. By the way, this is primarily driven by uh, EU initiatives, which I personally agree with. Uh, they they do increase uh, uh, costs and efforts in terms of compliance and, and regulatory clearances and competition clearances and so forth and legal advice, but um, they, they ensure that we have uh, uh, transactions that uh, are, are not, uh, are not uh, harmful to the environment, uh, are not conductive of uh, tax evasion, and they, they are at arm's length and they benefit uh, uh, the parties involved and local communities at the same time. So uh, I, I, I generally see increased regulation being a trend, uh, uh, but that I find a good thing. Absolutely. It seems to be the type of regulation that seems to be encouraging uh, business and investment uh, rather than impeding it and seems to be safeguarding its future because Cyprus seems to be doing such a good job of encouraging uh, this type of activity. Uh, and it, it seems like... Um, all current indications point to that trend continuing, uh, even in a turbulent, wider environment, which is uh, quite encouraging. Um, now, Anastasis, unless you had any other closing thoughts, uh, we have been very fortunate that the audience has engaged with us so far so well. Um, uh, if there's any parting thoughts on your part, I'm more than happy to, to uh, leave the floor with you. Uh, otherwise, uh, this would be a great place to say thank you very much for a very uh, illuminating and entertaining webinar and something that has educated us substantially. Uh, and for our audience, the slides will be shared. Um, and thank you to Anastasis for compiling those. And we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you very thank much, you. Anastasis. Thank you, Chris. Thank you for, for having me. Uh, it's been a real pleasure. I, I hope uh, it was informative and uh, we'll share those slides and I'm available for any follow-ups that anyone may want to ask. Fantastic. So thank you very much, everyone. Have a good day. Thank you.